I apologize for this patch. I do have an eye there, but I'm having some trouble focusing, so I'm wearing this patch temporarily. Um, Michael and I know each other for many years because in our previous careers we worked at the State Department of Health, Department of Health and Environmental Control. Mike was more involved with um, chronic disease, well, home care, but chronic disease especially, and I was more involved with infectious diseases. Actually, the distinction is not always as clear as you might think. Could there be some chronic diseases which are caused by an infectious agent? Yes, lady from Nigeria. Well, I would say yes. You have to speak much louder, please. Okay, I would say yes, like HIV. Could HIV is a good ahead. example. It's an infectious disease, but it's a chronic. It's actually a lifelong infection as far as we know. And what disease do you have? Uh, she's from Nigeria. What infectious disease do you have in Nigeria, especially in the northeast, which has been eliminated in all the rest of Africa, but not in your country? Polio. Polio. Polio is an acute viral disease, but you may have what lasting for life? When you get polio, what happens to you? Paralyzed. I cannot hear you. Raise your hand, please. What happens when you get, when you get polio? Paralysis. Paralysis. Does the paralysis go away after two weeks? No. How long does the paralysis last? last? It can last for lifetime. No, it does last for life. So that's an example of an infectious disease which has a chronic, actually a lifelong consequence. Likewise, are there any chronic diseases which are actually, by chronic I mean something like cancer or cardiovascular disease, are there any chronic diseases which actually are caused by infectious agents? For example, hepatitis B virus and hepatitis C virus affect the liver, it may give you what? cancer of the liver. That's a good example of a chronic disease due to an infectious agent. So Michael, we often talk about infectious disease and chronic disease. They are a bit in separate worlds, but they are what? They are overlapping worlds. But today we will focus indeed mostly on, uh, on uh, infectious diseases. Uh, you've had some background about this in historical and yes. epidemiologic co context. So we're going to go through some things very quickly. Just a quick word, because Michael was discussing with you uh, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, and someone said it's due, due to coronavirus. That's not quite correct. There are many, 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 many coronaviruses. So M MERS is caused by a coronavirus called MERS-CoV. COV stands for coronavirus. But let me give you another example of an important infectious disease caused by coronavirus. That was SARS. Do you remember SARS? from 2003. Severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS, is a viral respiratory disease of zoonotic, means coming, means coming from where? Animals, caused by the SARS coronavirus. That was also a coronavirus. So it's, so it's important to try, try and use good uh, nomenclature. Let me explain also. All the slides I will be showing you, you will have posted on Blackboard. Is that right, Michael? That's right. Um, so I'm going to go very, very fast through lots and lots of slides. Most, of the, most or many of them are just pictures of things, so you don't have to take notes. The important thing is to get the idea. We also, is it possible to talk about emerging infectious diseases right now in October 2014 without talking about Ebola? Not possible. How many of you have been reading or hearing about Ebola? Just, oh, she's the only one who hasn't been hearing about Ebola, and he hasn't been hearing either. You didn't raise your hand, okay? Okay. We'll start out with Ebola 101, then Ebola 202, then Ebola 303, okay? Ebola 101, these are things which we had been seeing in the newspaper in August, actually even back in July, even in June in retrospect, okay? And we were seeing pictures like this, disposing of corpses because even the cadavers were still infectious, covered, covered with the virus. Something interesting, Michael was talking to you about MERS and camels. Actually, where do camels get the, get the MERS coronavirus? The reservoir, may, ultimate reservoir, may be in bats. But what we have here is a virus, the Ebola virus probably circulates in, West Afri uh, in Central Africa in certain species of bats, once in a while then gets into non-human primates or certain herbivores, 
And then in Africa, as you know, lady from Nigeria, some people may go out in the bush and hunt meat. And maybe when they're uh, carving up the carcass and carving up the meat, they may become infected. And then people get infected. And unfortunately, this is a virus which can then go from person to person to person to person. This is unlike some other uh, diseases which come from animals. What's a disease of animals which is very scary? Ah! What disease is that? Ah! What disease is that? Where a dog may bite you, then you may die. Rabies. Rabies. Okay, I expect the class to be able to answer without my having to prompt them over and over again. Okay. If you have rabies going from a dog to a man, or raccoon to man, or fox to man, that is, does rabies then go man to man to man to man to man or not? It doesn't. Okay? But with Ebola, although it is, listen carefully, it is a zoonotic disease, Z-O-O-N-O-T-I-C, zoonotic disease, is transmitted from animals to man, it can then also go man to man to man. So we have something a little bit unusual here, okay? This is also part of Ebola 101. Most outbreaks in the past have been in Central Africa, in the Congo, in Uganda, in Gabon, and so forth. What's new is this outbreak in West Africa. We never had Ebola in West Africa before. Notice a little spot in Nigeria here. Have you been hearing about that at home? Right. You haven't been hearing about Ebola at home? We didn't have it before, but we have had a few cases now, but mostly in Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. Okay? What, where does the word Ebola come from? It comes from this river. This is the Ebola River in, uh, in Congo, it used to be Zaire. Um, and actually, th this will show you where the Ebola River is here, right in Central Africa. So here's Kinshasa down here, Brazzaville, here's East Africa. Uh, Rwanda, Burundi, Uganda, and so forth. And this is the Ebola River is a tributary of the Congo River. And the first recorded outbreak, one of the very first in 1976, was right near the banks of this river. Hence, we have the name Ebola. Mike Bird, I saw on one, uh, on one website someone saying that actually Ebola is a plot by President Obama to kill Christians. Did you hear about that? No, I haven't. No, it's because, listen carefully, how do you spell Ebola? E-B-O-L-A. B-O are the initials of who? Barack Obama. It shows that he maybe invented the virus to send it to kill Christians so the, so the liberals can take over. Okay? Okay. Ebola 101. This is the family of viruses that um, Ebola belongs to. It's very different in shape than many others, which are usually kind of round or, uh, or, or have geometrical symmetry. This is a long filament. That's why it's called a filovirus. It's a filament. Here's kind of a picture of the structure of it. It's like a long, skinny thing, a bit like a snake. And inside is the nucleic acid. These are the, the genes of the virus. Okay? Okay. That was Ebola 101. Ebola 202 really has to do with the global reaction <clears throat> to the virus, <clears throat> what have <clears throat> international organizations and world leaders done in response? Here are just some examples. This is Jim Young Kim. It sounds as if he would be from what country? Pardon me? No, Korea. Sounds like he's from Korea. He's actually an American, born of Korean parents. So he is president of the World Bank. It's a little bit unusual for someone who's in charge of a great financial institution that's a background is not economics or banking. He's a physician. He worked with Paul Farmer and Partners in Health for a long time. A nice example of how people from different walks of life may wind up being involved with, um, with, with public health. Here, oh, did, now this is early August, already saying $200 million in the emergency fund for this Ebola outbreak. Who is this lady? Margaret Chan, the Director General of WHO, would be very important to know about her. So in a way, she is the number one public health official for the planet Earth. Now, are there public health officials on planet Mars, Jupiter, or Saturn, or not? I don't think so. So therefore, she's the leading public health official for the entire solar system. 
That's another way to look at it, Michael, don't you think? Yes. Okay. So August 8th, she declares Ebola epidemic an international health emergency. That's actually a formal kind of designation. This is under something called the uh, International Health Regulations. Have you learned about that at all, the IHRs? If you're interested for a term paper, Mike, maybe Mike will let you write about the International Health Regulations, which were promulgated in 2005. But under those regulations, WHO can declare something uh, at a certain level of emergency. There have been only two other international emergencies declared. One was in 2009 when we had what? H1N1, a pandemic virus which went around the world, it turned out to be not so deadly. It probably only killed millions of people, but not hundreds of millions of people, okay? And the second one was because we still have polio, which has not been eradicated, and polio from Pakistan has recently spread back to countries where it has been eradicated, notably not far from where you are, what parts of the Middle East are now having bad fighting? Saudi Arabia is not having bad fighting right now. Yeah. Iraq. Iraq and Syria. Syria. So we've had polio again in Iraq and Syria, and we know the virus is actually is coming from Pakistan. I'll come back to that. So we've had H1N1 in 2009, which was an emerging virus. It was a new, new virus. Whereas polio, is that an emerging virus or not? No. It's an old virus, but it was doing something new. It was coming to countries where, hit, where transmission had been stopped. Listen carefully to the word transmission. A doctor is usually interested in the patient. Like, remember this patient here? Oh, poor goo goo goo, he has cough and so forth. In public health, the patient is fine. I want to help the patient. But from a public health point of view, why am I treating, why do I want this patient to be cured? So he will not do what? Transmit, Transmit to other people. So the, so the doctor's perspective is here, but the public health perspective is here, but also way up here. It's a much larger, much more complex kind of thing. That's why it's very good that you're coming here to School of Public Health to learn about things and not just having training in a hospital boardroom or something like that. You get some big perspectives. This is August 8th, okay? This is September 16th. Here's Dr. Bradley, who had gotten Ebola in Nigeria. Why is it important that he meets actually with the President of the United States in the Oval Office and shakes hands with him? What's, symbolic, what's the symbolic importance of this, do you suppose? Gentleman from Pano, why is this important? And if you don't know, you pass the question to the person on your left. Lady, from my, you're from Myanmar? Yeah, I'm what, from what, what's the significance of this? Uh, that show he cannot give infection to other people. That's right, symbolically important, because people are afraid of Ebola. This shows that even the president is not afraid. Someone has recovered from Ebola. It's also the question of, of stigma. So he's showing we don't have to be stigmatized. It's also a way to show from a political point of view and the mass media that he's, he's taking special interest in Ebola. He's not just meeting someone, um, someone who has <laughs> some other infection, like a common cold. This is very important, okay? He was Obama speaking, but look at the background. He's not speaking in Washington, D.C. Where is he? at CDC, symbolically very important. He went down in September to discuss Ebola at the CDC. Unusual, usually the director of CDC would go from Atlanta to Washington. No, here, the president himself went from Washington down to CDC. CDC now has dozens or maybe 50 or 100 people working now in West Africa on Ebola. Okay, here's Margaret Chan now. She's speaking now to whom now? at the United Nations. In fact, she was speaking to the Security Council. Okay, ladies from Saudi Arabia, what are the five countries that have permanent seats on the Security Council? If you don't, you pass the question to this gentleman from North Carolina. It's, it's, the United Nations headquarters is in what city? New York City. It's in New York. So we have the General Assembly which represents all the countries. Security Council has how many people? How many countries? Twelve countries, of which five are permanent members and seven rotate. The five permanent members are who? United States, Russia, China, England, and France. 
in seven other countries which, which, which rotate. Because by mid-September, it became apparent that Ebola is not just a public health crisis, it's also, I would say, an emerging global security crisis. So here's Dr. Chan. By the way, Dr. Chan is from what country? She's from Hong Kong. Okay. She's a doctor from Hong Kong. Okay. United Nations approves resolutions to create UN MIR, um, United Nations Mission for Ebola Emergency Response. Michael, this has never, ever happened before. In a way, this is like a separate operational unit of the United Nations just to focus on a single disease. Absolutely unheard of. Okay not just a public health crisis, it's a social crisis, humanitarian crisis, an economic crisis, and a threat to national security because the governments of these countries may fall. If you have loss of governments, you can imagine the kind of chaos that you may have and the possible spread to other places also. Obama speaking there also. Okay. How about Ebola 303? What's the next level beyond that? What we had before was Ebola in West Africa, and then we had <clears throat> uh, global response to that, but now the last couple of days we've had the first case of what? Now, we had had several Ebola patients treated in the U.S., but what's, what's the difference between this patient and the other patients that we had before, like the one who got to see President Obama? The one who saw President Obama got sick where? In Africa in Liberia. This patient got sick where? In Dallas. in Dallas, Texas. So it's the first time we had someone who got sick here. But listen carefully. He did not, Ebola virus was not transmitted to him in the United States. What everyone is afraid of now is that he may have what infected other people in Dallas who may become cases also. So the first cases were infected and diagnosed elsewhere, then came here. He was infected elsewhere, but came here while he was what? Incubating the disease. We'll look at that in a second. But he became sick here. First patient ever, okay? This is the chronology. It's so interesting. He left Liberia on September 19th. He did not fly to the U.S. He flew first to Brussels, and then from Brussels to Washington, D.C., and Washington to Dallas, where he arrived on the 20th. He did not become sick until the 24th. So, since the inc what is the incubation period for? Does anyone know what the incubation period uh, is? What does that What does that mean? Is newer here? Me. Newer. What does the incubation period mean? It's the time the virus needs to show symptoms on the patient. That's right. After infection, before you become sick, there's a certain delay. So, incubation period for Ebola would typically be about six to twelve days, or something like that. Let's say ten days. So if he became sick around the 24th, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, he might have been infected back here, 19, 18, 17, about the 16th or so. So he was incubating when he traveled to the U.S. and now developing symptoms. He went to a hospital. This is very important. Some of these people might wind up working in hospitals as hospital administrators went to a hospital where every hospital now knows that anyone coming in with fever, especially if you're an African, you should be asked if you came from Liberia, Sierra Leone, or Guinea. They asked him. Someone wrote it in the chart, patient with fever has recently arrived from Liberia. But the information was, we say, lost in the shuffle, unusual word. Could that ever happen in the real world, Michael, where a bit of information is here and does not get to the right people over here. That's a whole big issue about how information is communicated in a university, in a public health setting, or in this case, in a hospital emergency room setting. People said, oh, he just has fever and some headaches. It's probably just a viral infection. It was a viral infection. It was Ebola virus infection. They sent him home with an antibiotic, which is inappropriate for viral infection, so that's even almost a worse mistake than, than, give, than giving him, uh, than not letting him in the hospital. And he gets sicker and sicker by the 28th. He's admitted to the hospital, is now isolated. Why do they want him isolated? So he don't transmit the disease. That's right. 
You put in isolation so it does not transmit to others. And hospitals know how to isolate patients. They all have special isolation rooms, okay? And then the diagnosis is made that he has Ebola. Actually, I'm not so worried about this patient. He's just one of thousands of Liberians who've gotten Ebola. The question, what, the thing we want to avoid is that we have what? Transmission. If he infects, so once he's in the hospital, he won't transmit because the, patient, the hospital staff is all wearing gowns and gloves and masks and face shields and so forth. But between the 24th and the 28th, let's see, on the 25th and 26th and 27th, he could have transmitted. So 26 plus 10 days, 1, 2, 3, 4, plus another 6 days. Oh, October 6th, is that today? If you make it through today, and tomorrow, and the next day, and three or four more days, and no one else has gotten sick, we'll know there was not transmission. But all the people he was in contact with are now what? Under observation. So as soon as it becomes, while they're incubating, they're not infectious. But as soon as they become symptomatic, they could be infectious. Okay? So this is all well controlled. Okay? 80 people came into contact, probably only 10 are at risk, screening at airports. Huge consequences. Look at this. Michael, this is going to be the this will be a special collector's item. I'm going to rush down. I don't usually buy Time magazine. I'll have to get this one just so I can take the pictures in it. Chasing a bull, this is very dramatic, in West Africa and also in America. Nice example of an emerging infectious diseases affecting countries around the world and calling for United Nations uh, and global security concerns. Okay. Let's flash back a moment to some simpler times. I need someone now from North Carolina. Who is this? Oh, it says who it is. I'm sorry. Okay. Franklin Roosevelt. Okay, president in the 1930s. Um, next to Noor is, is uh, this isn't Hamad, he's elsewhere, uh, is uh, uh, Dua. Is that right? Yes. Dua. What disease did President Roosevelt have? You have no, no way to know. Gentleman from Pernod, what did he have? He had polio. Not commonly appreciated that the President of the United States had polio. He could not walk. He was rarely shown in his wheelchair. The, the press in those days was very discreet. When the President would come to give a speech, he'd come in in the wheelchair, sit down, and then the cameras would take pictures of him talking. Do you think the press would be so discreet nowadays? No, they'd be showing it all the time. Here he is, this is actually in Georgia in his wheelchair. And this is, uh, this is at the President Roosevelt Memorial in Washington, D.C., near the Jefferson Memorial. Those of you from other countries, have you been to Washington yet? Have you been to, the, to all the memorials, Washington Memorial, Lincoln Memorial, so forth? You need to go. Have you been yet? Yes, have you been yet? Essential to go. You can't come to the United States to study and not go there, all right? So... All right, who is this? This is a little trickier. So the president had polio, was paralyzed. This, this is President Roosevelt's wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, as a young lady. This must be on the wedding day. Here she is when she was a bit older, actually after her husband had died. Oh, she's on the cover of Time magazine too. Imagine that. Mrs. Roosevelt on the cover of Time magazine. She died in the 1950s. What did she die of? She died of tuberculosis, polio and tuberculosis, two old diseases. It's very dramatic to think that what we would call the president and the first lady would have infectious diseases like this. Do you think President Obama will get polio and Michelle Obama will get tuberculosis? How about President and Laura Bush? No. Before that, how about Bill and Hillary Clinton? No. Oh, the first President Bush. What was her name? Laura Bush? Michael? Do you remember? I think that was Laura. <clears throat> the point is that we have been <clears throat> in a transition phase because the Roosevelt was president when? In the 1930s. That's about halfway through the transition between the early 20th century where infectious diseases were leading causes of morbidity and mortality. Even presidents could get it. And the modern era, where the main concerns are cardiovascular disease and cancer, 
but where infectious diseases are still important, as we've seen with Ebola, and as we'll see with, with other issues as well. But anyway, <clears throat> this was not to have infectious diseases in the White House was not unexpected in the old days. I'm interested in the history of smallpox. Smallpox was eradicated. Did you know that George Washington had smallpox? Did you know that, Michael, when he was 19 years old? Did you know that Abraham Lincoln had smallpox during the Civil War? So any, do any, can President Obama get smallpox? Why not? Gentlemen from Turkey, why can't he get smallpox? Smallpox has been eradicated from the planet Earth since about 1977 and 78. Can you get smallpox? You cannot. Could there still be some risk? Yes, we'll come, we'll come, we'll come back to that. Actually, is there smallpox, Mike, Michael, on other planets, on Venus or Mars or Jupiter? We don't think so. Therefore, smallpox has been eradicated from the entire solar system. And if you're interested in astronomy, is there smallpox on any other planets? We don't know. I think not. Therefore, smallpox has been eradicated. There is no transmission of smallpox anywhere in the universe. Forgive me for being a little bit aggressive. I'm just trying to promote a big way of thinking about things that goes beyond the individual patient. Okay? <clears throat> Back to polio. I was in, in Tehran, Iran, which is right here, just a bit south of the Caspian Sea early in September. The red dots and the yellow countries show the only countries in the world where polio cases have been reported this year. And of those countries, it's a bit hard to see, only three countries are in solid yellow, in Asia, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, and in Africa, only Nigeria. Not in southern Nigeria, just mostly up in the north, okay? The other countries which are shown in yellow hatched in are countries which have had, which had previously interrupted poliovirus transmission, but have had re-importations from other countries. So here we have Somalia. I tell you, from Som is, is Somalia having a, a country with a very stable functioning government now or not? What do you think? It's sometimes called a failed state. It's a country really with a lot of disorganization. Very hard to do public health here. The case in Ethiopia probably came from where? Somalia. Can infectious diseases cross borders or not? It can come from Liberia to Dallas. It can go from Somalia to Ethiopia. We have spread of virus also to Syria. Is Syria in a very stable situation now or not? Catastrophic situation. Their virus is not a Nigerian virus. It's actually a Pakistani virus. Listen carefully. Molecular biological techniques can, for some infectious diseases can tell where the virus came from. There are genetic differences between the Asian strains and the African strains, so we know this is a virus that came from Pakistan. Where do you think the virus from Iraq came from? From Syria. So this is an example. Of, ah, this, so polio, polio is not a new disease. It's an old disease. You saw President Roosevelt with it. What's new is that it is coming back to countries where it had previously been eliminated. So we previously didn't have, uh, have polio here or here or here. Look at this. Right next to Nigeria is what country? Pardon me? No, this is, this is Togo here. Cameroon. This is Cameroon, okay? That's why I was asking you for, from Benin. So the, the, this is Ivory Coast, where I worked for two years. This is Togo, this is Benin, this is Nigeria, this is Cameroon in several places, okay? And from Cameroon, it's spilled over to the small country. Do you know what this is? You're from West Africa? It's Equatorial Guinea, okay? So <clears throat> what, what is emerging with polio is reinfection of countries where polio had previously disappeared. I was in Iran, Michael, they're a bit nervous because they're surrounded by polio from two sides, from countries where there is what? Conflict and possible migration. In Iran, they're very worried that after U.S. forces leave Afghanistan, there may be more fighting there, and therefore many refugees from Afghanistan may come where? Into Iran. 
Likewise, if you have constant fighting from ISIS and other things and Shiites and Sunni and Kurds and so forth, that you could have Iraqi refugees coming into Tehran. The question is, could you have transmission of polio virus in Iran or not? Here's Iran. I just showed this on the side. Take no notes. I was teaching for two days in the program organized by the International Committee for the Red Cross. I was teaching, oh, I was teaching epidemiology and control of infectious diseases. Okay? Here's a nice classroom there. Uh, let me ask, is this how a woman would wear, would come dressed for class in Saudi Arabia or not? Yes. It could be. Okay? Classroom, this is in a hotel. This is from Tehran, view of the mountains just north of the city. Ah, could this be Saudi dress for women or not? It's similar. The style is a little, little, little bit different. This is a student from Uganda, one from Singapore. We're visiting a, a royal palace. This is a little bit different style. Might women dress this way in Saudi Arabia or not? In my region, yes. Yes, it depend, depends on the region. This is very different. She's showing her ears. You can see her earrings. And she has lipstick, and this is really back in the back of her head. In fact, it's so far back, it was always falling off. So she had to pull, pull it back up, okay? I tell you, the, the best place to go eat is in a restaurant in, in Tehran. Michael, in the U.S., we eat at tables. It seems like such an odd thing to do. Here you're on a platform, you take off your shoes, you sit on a Persian rug, this is an Iranian doctor, a Swiss doctor. This is the wife of the Iranian doctor. This is her cousin. And you're out under the stars and the trees, and look what they bring you. This is really gastronomic heaven for sure. And in the U.S., we drink Coca-Cola. In Iran, they don't drink alcoholic beverages. I was surprised that they drink Coca-Cola. In Arabic, what does this say? Oh, it looks like Coca-Cola. Okay. All right, <clears throat> so back to Iran and polio. I am not so afraid of transmission of polio in Iran. This is World Health Organization information about estimated oral polio 3. That means what percent of children have had three doses of oral polio vaccine? It's not enough to go to the doctor or the hospital and get a dose of vaccine. And see, up, we vaccinated 10 children today. We vaccinated... 100 children in this village. From the point of view of the doctor or nurse, that sounds very good. We vaccinated 100 children. From a public health point of view, I want to know it's 100 children. That's just the numerator. The denominator would be what? Out of all the children who are eligible who should receive vaccine. In hospitals and doctor's offices, they're interested in numerators. From a population perspective, we have to have both numerators and denominators. So if you have 200 children in the village and you vaccinated 100 children, you've only vaccinated what? 50%. <clears throat> that is very poor. <clears throat> that would be an F. <clears throat> <clears throat> so this is in Iran. Back in 1980, estimated vaccine coverage or three doses of polio virus, only 38%. Gradually improved. They are saying now 98 to 99%. Whenever I see Michael 98 or 99 percent, I'm suspicious because I want to know how did, where do those numbers come from, okay? There are ways to know. Some numbers come from the government, and those numbers can enter into these results. But every year there is a WA, joint WHO and UNICEF conference of experts, and they look not just at what the Ministry of Health says, they also look at results from vaccine coverage surveys. Will they discuss something about surveys and sampling and so forth? <clears throat> but anyway, vaccine coverage is likely to be very high. So from my point of view, I'm thinking even if we have importations of polio from Iraq or Afghanistan or Pakistan into Iran, they, pro they could have a small number of cases, but they would not have sustained transmission. Okay, skip those. Vaccine schedule in Iran, you won't discuss this in detail. I just noticed a few things. Their schedule is very much like ours. They use BCG vaccine and we don't. Uh, in Nigeria, have you had BCG vaccine? Do you have a BCG scar on your arm? You don't? 
Uh, in Myanmar, do you get your BCG? Do you have a vaccine scar? You do. You have smallpox vaccine also? I don't think so. What year were you born? Okay, so it's possible, okay, because when you were a baby, there's still smallpox in the world. In Saudi Arabia, do you use BCG vaccine or not? Yes. You do. Do you have smallpox scar? I mean, a BCG scar? Yes. yes, okay. I point this out to the Americans just to show that why we, you know, we say, well, medical standard of medical care is such and such. Things can vary from country to country depending on the epidemiologic situation and the price of vaccines and disease control programs and many other things, okay? One other small example. Uh, in Nigeria, do you use oral polio vaccine or injectable polio vaccine? Oral. In Myanmar also. How about in Saudi Arabia, oral or injectable? Oral. In the U.S. now we use injectable because from oral there is a small risk, about one in a million, of getting paralyzed from the vaccine. Since we have no polio in this country, we can't even take a one in a million risk. In Nigeria, you need to take the risk because there's still polio in Nigeria. That's a whole story into itself. Okay. Okay. We mentioned, so we discussed polio because President Roosevelt had polio. How about tuberculosis? We saw that Mrs. Roosevelt died of tuberculosis. Is tuberculosis an old disease or an emerging disease? Polio is old, but re-emerging in places where it had gone away. The population of the world is about 7 billion people. <clears throat> about a third of the world's population is infected with mycobacterium tuberculosis. Fortunately, most, listen carefully, fortunately most people who are infected are not infectious. Most people who are infected are not sick. They are not sick, they are not cases of TB, they are not infectious, they are at no risk today of being sick. But in the future, their latent infection may progress to disease. So tuberculosis is a complicated disease. We have 2 billion infected, but only about 8 million cases per year. Of those 8 million, we have about 1 million deaths. Are the newspapers talking every day about the 1 million TB deaths in the country? What disease are they talking about every day, every hour? Right now, on the front page of the New York Times, they're talking about HIV and tuberculosis? Talking only about what? Only about Ebola, which has killed as many as 3,000 people so far in this outbreak since the start of the year. So if we have, eight mil, uh, we have one million deaths per year, that would be about, we'd have to work it out, um, that would be approximately um, two or 3,000 deaths per day. So it's so interesting that the media has become fascinated with Ebola but are, are not discussing things which happen every day. Actually, right now in Liberia and Sierra Leone and Guinea, the health system is focused on Ebola because they've had several thousand people. Does this have consequences for the rest of the health system or not? What, what else may happen with the health system there? A bit louder, please. The cases which are already epidemic. That's world. right. So, the, so they will, this is very important from a health systems point of view. If you put all your energy into one thing, you may miss your ability to focus on other things, which actually numerically could be a higher priority. So, for example, do you think malaria would be a problem in West Africa, and diarrheal disease, yes, and tuberculosis, and HIV? So, all those activities have now stopped. And actually, the numbers of deaths from, fa oh, how about routine things like safe childbirth and, and have hospitals that can perform cesarean sections. We have so many women and babies dying now from lack of maternal and child health care because all the emphasis is going on Ebola. That's why Ebola is not just an infectious disease. It's become now a social crisis for the, a, a, a health systems crisis for the entire system there. Okay. 
How do we know how much TB there is in the world? Because WHO gives us, gives us data. Where is WHO? It's in beautiful Geneva, Switzerland. And here's the headquarters for WHO. Those mountains in the background, by the way, are in France. And this is the other side of Geneva. Those mountains are also in France. So Geneva is at the end of this beautiful lake, but in the corner near France. TB case is 8 million. Okay, we can skip all these things. This is so interesting. China and India, 1 to 2 million cases each. Is it possible for a country to have a million cases of tuberculosis? It could be if what? Population is more than a what? A billion. Again, it shows the difference between looking at numerators, and in this case, the population would be the denominator. So we have, we, in, in disease control, we're very concerned with rates, and for TB, rates per 100,000. It looks like for India, it's about 170 per 100,000. It looks like South Africa is about 1,000 per 100,000. So when you're comparing one place to another, it's very important to look at the case rates. Here are some places, look at this. Swaziland in South Africa, very high. Sierra Leone, Michael, this is really a tragedy. So they are one of the highest places affected by TB, and all that's being disrupted right now. Let's see where the U.S. stands. Oh, way down here, actually, we're now down to about three per 100,000. <clears> the press in this state gets all excited. Oh, a case of tuberculosis. That's putting things in, in total lack of perspective. We have about 10,000 cases per year. <clears throat> whereas they have a million cases per year in China or India, and even in South Africa, which is a smaller, smaller country from us, about 500,000 cases. Okay. okay. TB, the U.S. going down, 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 so that what happened to Mrs. Roosevelt is unlikely to happen to Michelle Obama. TB in South Carolina, down, 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 down. Michael, the press had a big to-do last year about a TB outbreak in Greenwood, did the press ever discuss the fact that this is one of the most successful programs we have in the state? Not a word, just a lot, lot. So what one of the, I, I mentioned this as lessons to show that you could not get, well, newspapers and TV stations do give you information. I look at them also. But they may not give you the perspective that you need to understand what is really going on. It's important to, <clears throat> to get out the numbers and see where things come from. Who takes care of TB? <clears throat> Locally, here it's <coughs> DHEC in downtown. Here is the asylum building for crazy people, but it used to be a mental hospital. It's now a health department hospital. For those of you interested or may possibly work in hospitals, it's important to know that in the old days, there was really a separate, a separate health care system for tuberculosis just outside of town at Park Lane and Farrow Road. <clears throat> we should take the class there on the field trip sometime, Michael, and show them what can happen to a health facility once its raison d'etre, that means once its reason for being, has gone away. Out there we have the state archives, we have the state laboratory, but we also have this big building. It's a hospital. When you get closer, it's overrun by weeds. Look at this. It's all overgrown. And there's a symbol for the American TB Association. This is a TB hospital that closed. In the 30s, 40s, and 50s, it has 600 patients at one time. And the census fell from 600 to 500, 400, 300, 200, 100, <coughs> 90, 80, 70, 60, 50. When I came to South Carolina in 1976 to work with TB, one of her main jobs was not to open a TB hospital, but to do what with this hospital? Close it, because all the budget was going for what? What? Fewer and fewer patients. So the price per patient was doing what? Going up. The pa we still had a lot of patients, but the patients were not in the hospital. The patients were getting outpatient treatment therapy in their homes. So the money shouldn't go for the 5% of patients who are in the hospital. They shouldn't get 95% of the money. That was an imbalance between, between resources and the need. So to change an institution is very complicated. This took a discussion at high levels in the state legislature and so forth. The hospital was closed. And what we told, we told the, the, the government, we said, all right, 
if you close the hospital, we can save you $3 million per year. But please let us keep $1 million of those dollars so we can use it to strengthen health department TB services. Michael, is it possible that politics and money and budgets could interact with health care? Who knows? Of course it can. Okay. All right. Now, what is the basis for this concern about tuberculosis and polio and Ebola? In South Carolina, we have a list of reportable conditions. You can see it here a bit better. This says attention health care facilities, physicians, and laboratories. And actually, this is required by law. This is the legal basis for disease reporting. Law not always followed, but there is the law. Certain diseases should be reportable. Look at this immediately. It means right now, this patient has, oh, if a patient has Ebola, shall I call up the health department next month? You have to call now. Anything with an exclamation point, you should call right now. Oh, even measles, polio, rabies, smallpox, plague, severe things, call right now. Otherwise within 24 hours, otherwise within three days. Do you think other states have, rules, have laws like this? They do. Every state does. Do you think in Nigeria they have reportable diseases? They do. In Saudi Arabia? Yes. In Myanmar? Yes. Every country in the world. Now, the list may differ slightly, and the ways of reporting may differ. In the old days, it was by form. Then it was by computer. Sometimes now they even use my smartphones. I mean, all, or, or faxes, all kinds of ways to get, to get information through. Okay. How to report, what to report, to whom to report. When states report, where does that information go from each state? To the Federal Aviation Agency. Gentlemen from Turkey, when states report, county doctors and report to the local health department. Local health department reports to the state health department. Where does the state health department report to? In Turkey, they would report to where? The Ministry of Health. Yeah. Okay. In Nigeria, they report to where? Ministry of Health. In Saudi Arabia, Ministry of Health. We don't call it Ministry of Health. We have a Department of Health and Human Services, one agency of which is the Centers for Disease Control. So at cdc.gov slash MMWR, you have the weekly morbidity and mortality weekly report. I hope when you were out in practice, that either you or someone that you trust that with whom you work will every week look at the MMWR. This is, this is the issue of October 3rd. Look at this. Acute neurologic illness of unknown etiology in children in Colorado. Acute flaccid paralysis in California. Sounds like polio, but it wasn't polio. So <clears throat> here it says where to click on. If you click on publications, you can find all kinds of things. <clears throat> October 3rd issue, okay, increases in heroin overdoses. That's bad for the person who dies. Could that be a public health problem as well as a personal health problem? It could be if what? If this happens to enough people, if hundreds or thousands of people die of heroin overdoses, and besides, if one heroin user shares what? They need with somebody else, they could also get what? HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. So heroin use is a big public health problem, okay? Here's some data, okay? Let's see, in 2012, overall drug doses, accounts dr deaths from all drugs, oh, 23,000 deaths. Heroin, just 3,000. Let's see, Michael, how many deaths have we had so far from Ebola in the U.S. so far this year? Zero. Is the press talking about the thousands of heroin deaths? Not on the front page. OPR, this is opiate kinds of related drugs. Over 10,000 deaths. It's a people abusing pills which have uh, heroin or morphine like drugs in them. Okay? So, lots of information about all kinds of infectious diseases. Influenza activity. How many people die of flu, flu every year in the U.S.? Any ideas? 
about 25,000 per year. So is the press going to say, up, ah, one person died of flu in Dallas, Texas? Actually, flu season hasn't started yet. So there is some story about flu, but not this kind of hysteria see about Ebola. But look at this in this uh, October 3rd article uh, issue, three issues about Nigeria. The Nigeria issue is essential. If you might want to study this in great detail to learn something about what, what will happen in your country. We have to finish up in a, in a few minutes here. So Ebola virus disease outbreak in Nigeria. He's, um, Nigeria's actions seem to contain Ebola. Someone, someone flew from Nigeria, sorry, they flew from Liberia to Nigeria back in July. This was the confirmed case. Here he is. It was actually a Liberian slash American physician. He came to Nigeria, went to a clinic. At first, people didn't know that he had what? Ebola, and therefore he infected a lot of people. That's this cluster here. Notice this is when he was confirmed, and this is about what? 10 to 14 days later. Shows the length of the incubation period. This was kind of the first generation of cases. That's these. Actually, this, this case here um, was also one of the cases infected by the first, pace, first patient. That was um, slightly, slightly longer incubation period, okay? Now, this patient here then went to Port Harcourt. You know Port Harcourt? Ever, ever been there? That's where you were born. And he infected some other people. But the whole thing was stopped. You might call this first generation, second generation, third generation, three generation spread. It was all stopped. And how was it stopped? Local health workers paid 18,500 face-to-face visits to take the temperatures of 900 people who had contact with the cases. So 20 cases, let's say each one had approximately 50 contacts, 20 times 50 would be 1,000, right? What's done, what we are doing in Dallas, what they did in Nigeria, each contact is then checked daily for 21 days. Because if you haven't gotten sick after 21 days, that's the outer limit of the incubation period. Then you, if you haven't gotten sick then, you're not going to get sick. 21 times um, 100 would be 2,100. The number was actually a bit less. 1,800. So they did contact tracing, and they were able to do all this, and, they were and anyone who got sick, they would put in isolation. So if Nigeria can halt the spread of Ebola, do you think they can do it in Dallas, Texas? Of course, okay? So the same, same methods will be used here because we, have, we, we, we don't have a, a, a vaccine or other measures. So we're going to come down to the very last slide here. Okay. Some informal concluding notes. We are now, oh, at least a century into our demographic transition do they know about demographic transition? Shame. And epidemiologic transition, okay? People actually, even about 30 years ago, people said, oh, we have made this transition, infectious diseases will disappear. They have not disappeared, as you've seen. So infectious diseases remain of concern. In fact, sometimes the public is even more worried about infectious diseases than they perhaps need to be. Numerous infectious disease wars are being fought simultaneously. In some cases, we just want to control the disease, like flu. In some cases, eliminate it. For example, measles has been, listen carefully, eliminated from the United States. Eliminated. Eliminated, okay? That means we don't have transmission anymore in the United States. In fact, measles has been eliminated from the entire Western Hemisphere, from Canada all the way down to Argentina and Chile. No more measles. No child gets measles. In the old days, every child has measles. Now no child gets measles except for what? Importations. 
again, virus crossing boundaries, but then the virus cannot transmit because immunization levels are too high. So sometimes just disease control, sometimes disease elimination. If you want to get rid of something for the whole planet Earth, we call that disease what? Eradication. The only disease to be eradicated so far is what? Smallpox. Polio is close, except for those few countries which have conflict and fighting, or the parts of countries where there's conflict and fighting, which shows the interrelationship between politics and conflict and public health, okay? Just as some diseases seem to be on the way out, such as smallpox, polio almost gone, guinea worms and parasitic diseases, others seem to be on the way in. So Ebola we're worried about now, other diseases, these are mosquito-borne diseases which are spreading to new countries. So some are, I don't know, emerging, while others are uh, uh, unemerging, or we hope, hopefully on the way out. It's a bit like watching a play where the world is on the stage. And some actors are leaving the stage, but others are doing what? Coming onto the stage, okay? So there are tremendously complex infectious disease challenges ahead. All hands need to be alerted and be on deck.